Pixel, and I'd like to welcome you all to WetPixel Live. I'd like to introduce our regular contributor, Alex Mustard. Hi, Alex. Hi, Adam. Good to see Good you. Good to see you too. Um, so today we were going to talk about vintage lenses and to discuss what vintage lenses are and why we might want to use them as underwater photographers. So um, with that, Alex, what are they? Um, well, vintage lenses are old-fashioned lenses of perhaps more simple design than modern lenses. Um, they're not as sharp as modern lenses, but under or, or photographers in general become interested in using them because the nature of their optics give our pictures a slightly different look. Mm -hmm. And particularly as you take more and more pictures, you're often looking for ways to differentiate your work from the crowd. Yep. And this is one of many methods that photographers might use to do that. Yep. The one that I use the most is, is this one, which is a... Um, in the short name for it is a Tria Plan 100 mil lens. Yep. So it's a 100 mil lens, very similar to a normal macro lens. Portrait it's not lens, a macro yeah. lens, it's a portrait lens. Yep. But with a few modifications, we can make sure that it focuses close enough to basically use it as a 100 mil type macro lens underwater. It's an entirely mechanical lens. There's no electronics in this, so it can't talk to my camera. Um, yep. And as a result, I can't change things like aperture underwater unless I have a gear to do that. But typically this lens, you shoot it wide open at f2.8 to create a really interesting bokeh effect. Sure. Because really where these lenses look different from a modern lens is not really so much in the bits that are in focus, but it's how it, they render bokeh, how they re render out of focus elements of the picture yep. um, to look different. So I shoot this lens fixed at f2.8, and then I have a, a focus gear that I've rigged on here that's normally got the teeth on, got the teeth on at the moment, um, that allows me to focus the lens through my housing zoom control. Yep. But I do most of the fine focusing by rocking in and out when shooting with it. Yep. And then I've got an extension tube on the back of the lens um, that actually helps the lens focus a bit closer, yep. which makes it more usable underwater. And then I use this inside my housing with um, drop-down diopters in front of it. I usually, usually a sub-C plus five, and a fit plus five, which are actually different strengths underwater. And those usually then bring the focus into a nice range for me to focus on, um, to use underwater. The other thing I would say about it is often because you're shooting the lens wide open, the ambient light can be too strong for it underwater. So I regularly use it with a, a neutral density filter on the front as well. Yep. Usually um, a two stop neutral density. So an ND4 or something that's about right yep. for, um, for dropping the light levels down. And it just keeps it, if you put too strong a new density filter, you can't see through to do your critical focusing. And they're not the easiest lenses to focus anyway. And if you put too weak a one on, the ambient light tends to overwhelm everything. So, so, right. so a couple of things then. So what types of image, what, what, are, you, what are we shooting here? Are we shooting here muck diving? Are we shooting midwater? Where, where does this lens lend itself best um, to being used? Well, it, it's really about how things look out of focus. So there's a few different ways we can use mm. that. I was going to, show you some pictures in a minute, but mm. either um, we can use it to focus on a subject and make the background look really unusual and different. Yep. And we're just looking for patterns of color and light that are gonna look really interesting out of focus in the background. Yep. And ultimately you're almost looking for anything that you can put in front of it. Yep. And I often joke that I call it the damselfish lens because you just want a subject that stays relatively still and hovers in front of things. Yep. And damselfish do that really nicely. Yep. So. Um, you also want to look for subjects that are going to look really interesting out of focus. Yep. So where you have strong contrast of colors, so, you know, strong colors next to each other, when they, they blur, they'll, they'll look really interesting, or highlight and dark next to each other, again, they'll, they'll blur very interesting in a bokeh. Yep. But there's a lot of experimentation in it, and I don't say I've got all the answers for that. Um, there are quite a few different lenses you can play with for this, yep. and I was actually just going to grab my book yep. to read out the list for you because... Um, I can never remember all the names, but some of the ones that I talk about in my book is the Tria Plan 100, which I use, yep. and the 50 mil. And actually, one of the pictures I'm going to show you is from the the Tria Plan 50 mil. Right. Other lenses is like the Primo Plan um, 58, Dia Plan 80, Petzval 85. The Petzval is super expensive, actually, um, but that might be worth worth using. I my lens is an original Tria Plan. It was very cheap to buy. Um, because this lens has become popular in underwater photography, um, a company has made continuation versions of this lens, yep. which I don't know if they're any sharper or better than the original. I've not heard anything amazing about no, them, no. but they do at least make it more available. For uh, and and they definitely still mimic the, the, the bokeh effect that we have in the original. I, I say I don't, I don't 
think they're any any easier to use. Yeah. Um, but uh, but I think that the the the, the, the it's like mobile bowl case still I very think much yeah, they are it. a bit more expensive. They do will then natively fit onto your cameras. Yeah. And some of the things that I've had to rig up with this. But to be honest, it wasn't all that difficult to buy a little adapter and put an extension tube yeah. on it yeah. to make it focus yeah. well for me. And anyone who's interested, that's a twelve mil extension tube yeah. on it. Yeah. If you're which is one of the standard sizes that comes. So I was gonna show you some pictures now. Um Great. And this first one is a C fan in Fiji photographed completely out of focus so this is one of the ways i, I like to to use the um to use the lens yep. and i think this creates a really beautiful painterly effect i think it's a really attractive very graphic image yeah it's obviously not sharp in any of there's no sharpness in this picture at all but I, I just really like the mixture of the red and the blue i think it looks really pretty so this is a really interesting way to use it and you know, almost anything underwater can start to look quite interesting when shot in this way. So the fan itself, so the orange parts of the image, they're lit with the strobe, I see. It, yeah, this is yeah, it's, it's, this is strobe and balanced light picture. Yeah. Just it's just an out of focus picture. Yep. Uh, but taken purposely out of focus to create yep. and capture this feeling. I think you know, it definitely has feelings of movement and wafting, and yep. it looks almost like a fire. I, I really like this picture. Yep. It's not very popular. I really like it, but <laughs> it doesn't really. It's not a picture I show very much. Um, this nature of Bangai cardinal fish hovering over the top of a fire urchin. And again, the bokeh has created different, interesting, unusual effects in the background. Yep. So rather than being a completely sharp image, there's sharpness in it and then increasing amounts of blur. Yep. So, so at F2.8, obviously, you've not got much depth of field. And that's really what, what you're maximizing here is the fact that obviously the, the, the cardinal fish are relatively sharp, but the... the, the um, the fire etch is basically defocused. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and that's what you're sort of looking for all the time. Yeah. This next one is a harlequin crab underneath a a tube and an enemy. Yeah. And this one, I, I actually love how the the out of focus tentacles of the anemone render. Yeah. So it's just a relatively subtle effect in this one. Yeah. It just creates this feeling of it. I, I call this picture the, the, the carousel because it. It looks like it's spinning around, like a, Does. a carousel of horses or something around the, the yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, very nice. Um, the next picture is this um, sort of um, pepperminty um, crinoid shot, green and purple crinoid shot. Um, and this is just the detail of crinoid arms completely defocused. Um, and the lens has created really interesting effects on this. And I do like using it in this way to create these very abstract pieces of, of art. I'm not very good at selling these shots i think i really like them as prints mm. but i don't really have an output for that but i, I really like them and I, I continue to shoot them i think that's the, 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 the way it's rendered the the detail into little circles is fascinating really so, mm. yeah. Um, yeah 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 and that's sort of a specific thing of that particular lens yeah now yeah. a little bit more sort of back to a more normal use of the with the pig use of the with the pygmy goby inside the um polycarpa what's he called the, the golden um um, golden tunica. Tunica, yeah. Uh, yeah, and this you've got the subject nice and sharp, and then the, the colourful patterns of the tunica all blurred out to be focused. Really yeah. Type of image, and that's kind of I guess a bit more of a classic way of shooting it. I like the fact that you can take quite abstract views. This next one, this one is a a saddleback anemone fish guarding eggs, mm. and eggs always look great as bouquet mm. um, because they they blow up into circles. And I was actually shooting the eggs. And then the anemone fish swam into frame. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I just hit the shutter. And so slightly lucky shot this. But I love the anemone fish being right on the edge of the frame. It's, I find it very artistic and interesting composition. This. Yeah, some of the composition, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you wouldn't want this to be your first ever picture of an anemone fish. But when you've got lots of pictures of an anemone fish, it's a different way to take things. Yeah. Um, next up um, is a seahorse on a sea pen. Yeah. This seahorse was um, it's a male thorny seahorse attached on a sea pen um and actually this one i like the how the lens has rendered the the seabed behind it mm. it just it, it's got a feeling for me of movement of waves passing through the ocean you know very different type of shot this you know maybe not one that everyone likes but i, I find this you know really interesting really different type of underwater so, so just it's so obviously the background of this image hasn't gone into the the soap bubble it hasn't gone into the little circles is that... No, that's because there's too much fine detail in it. Right, okay. So just one circle is kind of obliterating the next one. But it's created a really 
different effects. When has, you've got yeah. points of light yeah. in the background, they'll make circles. Yeah. When you've got blobs in the yeah. background, they won't make circles because there's too much detail in it. So a classic kind of muck diving, you basically get yeah. this kind of very ethereal kind of kind of blurred out background. Um, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. muck diving typically, you know, the background is ugly. Yeah. But I think this background is really quite pretty. Yeah. So you've yeah. turned ugly black sand into something that's actually aesthetically interesting. Yeah. And after all, that's what we're trying to do as photographers is to create something that people want to look at. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. The next picture is is back to the bubbles in the background. Yeah. Um, and this is an Amphius photographed at at sunset against the light patterns on the surface created by the sun. Wow. And I have to say this is the quick way to make yourself fly. Because you're basically looking, pointing your camera straight at the sun on the surface of the water and trying to take a picture as the Amphia swims through the frame. Um, but it, it, I think it creates a really nice effect. This is yeah. a very hard shot to get, um, to get the Amphia in focus at f2.8 when it's swimming and also get it in front of really nice bubbles in the background. But really nice. And this, um, I think it's the, the penultimate one, is a damselfish in front of these blue wiggly squiggles. And this was a case that I spotted these blue wiggly squiggles and thought those would look really nice as a background. And then it was a case of finding anything to photograph them in front of it. And luckily, chalky dip damselfish like this one or damselfish tend to hover in front of things. The squiggles are actually parietes coral in the Red Sea in morning light. So the light was coming down over the reef and catching the edges of the parietes coral. And it's creating a very strong contrast. And when it was out of focus, it created this ripply effect. And I think it's just a lovely background to frame this fish. Yeah, you um, mentioned... So you just found this lens, kind of looking at subjects underwater, thinking, I wonder how that looks out of focus. And then you pull the lens up and have a look at it and go, oh, yeah, that works. Yeah. What can I get in front of it? Yeah. Or is that enough on its own to make an interesting picture? So, so selecting a pleasant background and then finding a subject to, to put in, in the middle of it. Yeah. 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 yeah, and obviously I'd love to have something more exciting than a, a chalky dip, but damselfish are the, the, the convenient poses. Yeah. And then another use for these lenses is where you've got, you know, a pattern of subject matter. So the final shot is these squirrel fish, sorry, soldier fish in the black bar soldier fish in the Red Sea. And there's soldier fish in focus in the front and then going increasingly out of focus as the picture goes backwards. And I think that's quite a fun way to use this lens where you've got groups of, of animals, have them sharp at the front going backwards. This isn't with the 100 mil, this is the 50 mil um, trio plan. But I, I like the effect of them just getting more and more defocused through the picture um, and creates a really nice and different effect. Now, I wouldn't want my entire portfolio. This is the last picture I want to show you. Um, we'll go back to just being us on the screen. But um, I wouldn't want all my pictures to look like this. But when you're looking for ways to make your portfolio diversify, to differentiate from other photographers, um, I think these pictures really add a lot of difference to my portfolio of work. So they're, they're pictures that I'm really happy. So that for me is the value of these little guys is they give you these shots. And I think particularly in destinations where you shoot a lot, it's a really great way of diversifying your portfolio, particularly if you buy one of the less fashionable ones and actually you can pick them up for almost no money. Yeah. The, the last shot I paid 50 pounds for the lens. Yeah. Yeah. Well, know, they, they, they really cost nothing. It's a bargain. It bargain really, isn't it? I, I think the, um, I mean, there definitely was a bit of a trend towards the the, the soap bubble bokeh um, a few years mm -hmm. ago, um, and that that possibly meant that. But as is always the way, these things will will cycle around, and we'll we'll see mm -hmm. them we'll see them we'll see them become more and less popular as time goes goes around. Um, yeah, I think if you just think of it differently and do use it in a different way, yeah. and I, I personally wouldn't make going for the bubbles the the be all and end all. Yeah. But I would make um, you know. I think when you start to look in different ways to use the bouquet, yep. I think, you know, that the seahorse shot, you'd yep. never say that's a bubble shot, nope. like you were saying, yep. but I think it's a really lovely texture. Yep. And the sea fan at the beginning, there's no bubbles in that one, yep. but again, the texture looks, looks really beautiful. Yep. No, that's wonderful. Thank you, Alex. Um, so you mentioned that um, we could see more, a list of, of potential lenses that we could use in your book. Uh, yeah. That's obviously... Um, Alex's um, um, Underwater Photography Masterclass is available from Amazon and other reputable bookstores. 
Um, I would I imagine think. so. Also, um, is an ebook online as well. Yeah, the, oh. the the ebook version comes with video as well, which is actually really useful. And um, often a good thing, you know, before you go on a trip, is just to run through the videos, and that gives you a, gets you back, gets your head back in the right place before you set off. So um, once you've watched all your wet pixel lives, yeah, well, absolutely, yeah, that's right, mm. yeah. Um, hours of fun. Um, so thank you very much, Alex. Um, and. I'd like to thank our sponsor, which is Backscatter Photo and Video for this episode. Um, I'd like to thank you all for watching. Um, and please feel free to add a like if you enjoyed it or to add comments and suggestions for future episodes in the comment section below. Thank you very much. And